Welcome to the CIO Evolution. In this podcast, we'll explore the Chief Information Officer's role in executing a new ongoing leadership imperative, digital transformation that promotes agility and resilience. How do CIOs upgrade legacy networks? What are the financial challenges CIOs face? And what are the security measures that are required in the new work from anywhere, mobile and cloud-based world? Well, today we'll be speaking with two innovators and strategists who know how to apply the technology and architecture to drive measurable business outcomes. Welcome to our show, Phil Armstrong and Dan Shelton. And Phil, for the benefit of our audience, give us a little bit about your background and your experience as a technology leader. Thank you, Les. Really nice to be here. Uh, Yeah, I'm a technology leader. I've worked in technology for 43 years now across 49 different countries, primarily in the financial services sector, investment, capital markets, insurance, wealth management. Recently retired as a CIO only two months ago, but I'm doing a lot of advisory work with uh, some of the world's leading organizations to discuss this very topic, which is how do you move to a sustainable environment where you've got business adaptability and yet in a safe and secure manner? And Dan. Les, thank you very much for having me. And Phil, it's great to be part of the conversation. But uh, I'm Dan Shelton. I'm Head of Transformation Strategy with Zscaler. My role at Zscaler is very similar to what Phil's doing. It's it's providing consulting-like services to our customers as they're looking to evolve their strategy on how to deliver these types of services to their business in the future. And for me, prior to joining Zscaler, I was running global infrastructure for a large pro services company based out of Detroit, where You know, we had offices in 23 countries, 900 of them, and we used this model of zero trust that we're going to talk about later to really drive some significant business impacts for the business or really within the business processes. And kind of for me, it was about growing up in technology in that infrastructure space and networking and managing firewalls and data centers and large global service contracts. And so look forward to kind of sharing that insight and what we see organizations doing now, as well as what I led when I was on the customer side as well. That's great. Thank you. Phil, obviously, 43 years, you started when you were a teenager and the labor laws must have been different back then. England, Um, yes. (laughs) But you've had tremendous experience. What I've admired about your career is you are one of those leaders that can look at what has to be done at the transactional mechanical level, but you have the strategy in mind. So when you think about cybersecurity today and the context of what has to be done for any enterprise to scale, in a secure and safe way. What's working and what isn't working in cybersecurity? I'm happy to say there's a lot more working these days than there was maybe a decade ago. I think the power of the cloud less has been a huge sort of game shifter for cybersecurity and defensive organizations. Just the extensibility of the cloud and computing on demand, but also the introduction of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which are making their way into solutions has really been a godsend. You know, as the sophistication of the bad guys increases, you need more sophisticated tools to provide those defenses. So I think that's been fantastic. I think we've done a good job raising awareness and and education, maybe within the organization. I'd like to see a little bit more education and awareness at the board level. I think that's a little light and we could do better there. I think we've done a good job in um, defense in depth having overlapping and multiple solutions, which makes it difficult to penetrate an organization. Multi-factor authentication has been fantastic. But I think we're at this sort of precipice right now where new architectures are coming into the industry. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the podcast, but these new architectures are not only working, they're going to work even better to future-proof organizations as we go forward. So that's what I see as working. That's excellent. And and Dan, you mentioned transformation. Obviously, the big buzzword is, oh, we're going through digital transformation, but not everybody really understands what that means. What is digital transformation in in your mind? And, And ultimately, what is the role of cybersecurity at a strategic level for transformation? You know, something that I talked often with customers about is the kind of cliche buzzword of, you know, what is digital transformation? Because you ask a different person, there's going to be a different definition of what that really means to an organization. But Phil kind of said it when he talked about cloud as the enabler. 
it's part of that strategy. It's part of moving from this model where IT services were delivered to the business in the background and just kind of a necessary evil to being a true partner in helping organizations change their processes, how they operate to be more agile, to have an experience for their users where people can be productive, but more importantly, you never kind of circumvent that visibility and control aspect that you need to be able to deliver so you could stand up in front of your board, like Phil mentioned, and, and have these conversations of, hey, we have things under control. We understand where our data is. We know that cloud is an enabler. It's helping us refine and optimize our business processes. But at the same time, we're doing it in a way that's not putting the business at risk. So when we talk about transformation, that's what it really is. It's about the business processes that are being impacted in a, in a positive way to drive significant business outcomes for the customers. And so coming back to you, Phil, on that, thinking about the strategic role, if you will, of cybersecurity, there's this argument that if you have your cybersecurity the right way, you can be more competitive. Is that right or is that wrong? Is it a transactional thing or is it a strategic thing or is it both? I've been listening to this debate going on for a decade now. I don't actually think it's a debate anymore. I think we've got to the point where having a good cybersecurity plan and architecture and approach that's integrated with your business plans and your business architectures and the culture of your company is strategic. It's a strategic advantage. I mean, people say, you know, some companies are lucky they haven't seen a breach or been attacked. But look really is the residue of design. And I think it really shows that those factors I've just been talking about are lined up, aligned, and congruent. And there's no debate anymore. It is definitely strategic. When you have a progressive cybersecurity architecture that's embedded into your business architectures, your corporate culture, the, the way that you work, it allows you to enable a few things. And these things are vitally important. No one would say business flexibility is not important, especially coming out of the pandemic. Companies are looking at their products and their services. They rewired them to work remotely and in times of the pandemic. And so as we come post-pandemic, some products and services are not going to work the way they used to. And so the business needs flexibility in order to change their product sets, the way they distribute things, the way customers buy and consume those services from these companies. Some companies want to emerge out of the pandemic stronger than what they went into it. And so they're looking at divestitures or add-ons and acquisitions. And they're also now starting to have a lot of conversations around what does a modern workplace look like? Are some of these employees actually going to come back to the office or are they going to stay at home? Are we going to have a hybrid environment where some are in the office some are at home full time and some are doing both. And so they're looking at the economics of this too. And some companies have done well, but some are really struggling and there's budget constraints and pressures on budgets. And so all these very strategic things have to be underpinned in a way that they can be executed on, but do it safely. Don't put the organization at risk. And so that's why I think a cybersecurity strategy has to be embedded into these other strategic imperatives of the company. Otherwise, we're going to have a very different type of a conversation. I had the same experience as a customer. And uh, when I was running an infrastructure for the pro services company, and really, it was very much a function until at which point we brought in all of the different disciplines of IT. We had a strategy that we put together with a basic premise of, we have to have a balance of user experience and security. And when we were able to confidently stand up in front of the business and say that we can have that, and doesn't matter what device, where the users are, what resources they're trying to access, then we were looked at. Actually, IT went from the black box where they threw a ton of money, is looking at look from that, looking at it then as a partner, right? An enabler. And that's something that, you know, there were several examples of the business wanting to be more agile and leverage cloud-based services where IT wasn't involved in the decision-making process of, hey, we want to use these tools. The business came to us and said, look, this is what we want to leverage to deliver these capabilities to our customers. And when we had a model that was then, again, built with user experience, security in mind, 
that regardless of what device, where it was going on the internet, sitting in a data center, then we were able to just say yes to the business instead of always saying no, and we need these additional infrastructure components and capacity. We were able to make decisions based on, hey, look, you as the business owner for this data, if you're comfortable of where this data is sitting and where it's going to reside with that partner, that SaaS provider, then the answer is absolutely. We'll turn it on, we'll enable it, we'll have visibility and control into it. But as soon as you're able to confidently stand up in front of the business and say those things, that's where they look at you as the enabler. But again, I can't stress enough, what we learned was very much around the fact you needed to include all of the disciplines of IT in those pieces, because when it was just a function and not a strategic enabler, it was only security, being involved in the security conversations and then infrastructure, then application development, at all of those different silos, they all wanted to do something else. But when we included them all together, then it was very much, we kind of did some course correction and, and really became that enabler for the business. And Dan and Les, you know, I've been having conversations with a lot of technology leaders globally lately, and it seems like this theme's coming through in that we all feel like we're in the middle of a perfect storm. There's all these things happening around us and these different pressures from our business colleagues to adapt the business or grow the business or pair back the spending and do all that at once, but do it safely. And I think people are trying to deliver solutions to whatever stage your company's in. And we're all sort of landing in the same spot, which is there's a solution out there. It's not a panacea, but there is a solution out there which involves changing the cybersecurity architecture, zero trust, which seems to tick off a lot of those boxes that we're struggling to evolve in our company. And when you look and dive deeper into zero trust, it does tick those boxes and it does give you a little bit more sustainability on your investment as well as help you future-proof uh, your business. So there's a consensus now that's building and a big shift towards zero trust to help uh, technology leaders move in that direction. So this is the one question I want to ask both of you then. So it seems like this is, just by the way you're describing it, a question of trust. You just use the word trust. And you look at it within the organization, but Dan, just as you said, across the organization, and then Phil, as you said, this is a very strategic thing. This is not a, a simply a tactical IT or technology or security person's idea or approach, but it's also part of your supply chain, part of your customer's trust as well, and ultimately the sovereignty of their data and so on. So what does zero trust mean? You just use the term. So what is that? Can you define what zero trust is? Yeah. So I'll jump in first from a business perspective, because I do elevate this to a strategic conversation. I think there's probably a couple of things that are really top of mind for technology and business leaders these days. It's around sustainability. It's around competitiveness and innovation. And it's around improving your customer experience and your employee experience, because they will have choices. And so making a work environment in the future that is productive and efficient in terms of cost. There's a few things that are evolving, though. There's a lot of solutions around cyber and protection that are cloud-based. And there's a massive sweep globally to move services and assets to the cloud. But some of our larger organizations that have been established you know, over 100 years old have hybrid environments. And they have mainframe environments and minis and, and legacy debt that are housing platforms and technologies. We don't like to talk about this, but platforms and technologies that are the lifeblood of the companies. They generate and process most of the revenue that flows through the companies. Maybe they're bespoke. Maybe they were developed with tentacles into the environment, which make it exceptionally difficult to move these products and services and platforms to the cloud. It's going to take decades. I myself have experience of putting business cases together to relocate these. And they've been in the hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to move a platform to the cloud. That's not feasible, especially in these economic times. And so what Zero Trust is doing is it's bringing in a new business architecture. I know it's a security architecture, but it's actually underpinning a new business architecture that reaches into how employees and customers will safely engage with the company, how you can mask those poorly architected solutions. Maybe they were developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s when today's cyber security requirements 
were not even a consideration. So imagine if you could take that off the network, take it off the internet and obfuscate it, cloak it, hide it, where you can't attack what you can't see. But it also buys the management team a bit more time, a bit more runway to come up with solutions around are they going to replace it, retire it, are they going to reformat it, et cetera. And so what's exciting about this new architecture, Zero Trust, is that it seems to tick all those boxes, as I mentioned, in that it buys you a bit more time to be thoughtful around your legacy debt. This is the first real solution for legacy that we've seen emerging that's scalable and sustainable. But it also addresses those other components of cloud and cloud properties and multi-cloud and hybrid environment and a better work experience in a safe way. And let's just to add on that, I mean, really from, I lived through a deployment of what is now called Zero Trust Network Access. At the time, we called it Protect the Core. And it was essentially just going through this model where we took a proactive approach to our security policies, but we wanted to have adaptive controls and continuous verification on what comes in and out of the data center, what people are allowed to leverage. And, and Zero Trust really is around following least privileged access principles. But you take it and don't just center it around a network, but center it around identities, endpoints, applications, the data that actually resides in those applications, and the overall infrastructure. And when you do that, it really sets you up to have this model where you can prevent and respond to any threats that you do see in a more quickly and efficient manner. But what it means for your business is it allows you to use the native tools kind of that come with cloud and infrastructure as a service um, programs and host your applications, host your workloads in those um, environments without having to put all of these infrastructure components in that created friction in the past. When I'm talking about most VPN clients, firewalls, all these different infra network, private network peering points in colo data centers, things like that. And when you move to this model that where you just use the internet as your network, cloud as your data center, you have that visibility. And again, the least privileged access controls around those different disciplines and the ecosystem of IT, that allows you to work in this hybrid model where your business can have some other workloads in a data center because, hey, they may still be anchored to a mainframe or an AS400, or they can have a majority of them in cloud, but it doesn't matter for the user on how they access those systems. And it doesn't matter from a security perspective because you treat all of the access the same. Again, following that least privileged access model. One of the nice things that I've seen about this as well is, you know, as a C-suite IT executive, it usually falls on me to go to the board or go to the executive team, the capital committee, and pitch this for funding. And you're competing against other sources of funding. And if you work in a large organization, because this is a company-wide implementation and change, if you work in a large distributed organization, you're hoping that each of your distributed business units are all at the same level of maturity, they're all aligned, and they're all willing to chip in to fund an initiative like this. And it's a challenge because you're running around with your tin cup trying to get funding for something which is transformational for the company and very strategic. And typically what happens is, you don't get everybody aligned and you don't get the funding. I've implemented this five times at five different companies. And one of the nice things that I've seen coming out of this is it really simplifies your infrastructure. If you think about traditional data centers with its DMZ that are clogged full of boxes and firewalls and web application firewalls and routers, and you've got MPLS, telco, which is expensive. You've got VPN access for all your customers and your remote workers, which is a bit flaky and doesn't really scale well. Imagine getting rid of all that. Imagine if you could say, I'm going to pare all that down, scrape it all out. I don't have to do patching. I don't need my patching team anymore. I don't have to have all those licenses. So you start adding up all those savings. And in large companies, I mean, my budget was well north of a billion dollars annually. I was protecting $2.1 trillion in other people's money in assets under management in my previous job. I could literally self-fund this by the savings and put a very good, attractive business case together 
where not only was I not going to the business to ask for funding to do this, I could do it from my own budget within IT. But at the end of it, I could show a business case that was actually reducing my run rate, my operational run rate. So I was running more efficiently, cheaper, and I could cough up savings at the end of the business case and increase the coverage and the cybersecurity protection of the organization, as well as enabling all those levers that we previously mentioned. And both of you explained this in such a clear and and lucid manner and and to the benefits, Phil, that you just described. I kind of wish I'd had you on my team to go to the board just on what you just said. I mean, when you look at this, and Phil, you mentioned this before, there isn't a company that hasn't actually faced a threat. You, You put it in different words, but that's essentially it. So when you look inside, and Dan or Phil, either one of you, and you look now inside of of IT, because that's maybe where you have to start thinking about this, what are the challenges that you face in the zero trust architecture? Now, I'm convinced this is beyond buzzwords at this point, so you've got me there. So what is now the challenge if you really want to go forward with a deployment? What's the first step you got to take? Being able to fund these things with your own budget, it absolutely can happen. But the first step has to be kind of including all of those different disciplines of IT, right? And getting the buzzwords out of the conversation when we're talking about building a strategic architecture for the future. And when I say the buzzwords, I'm, you know, the zero trust is a moniker that's been coined. It, it's every single security vendor says they do it even the vendors that have had the same architecture for the last 25 years, and they're calling it now zero trust, right? Right. But it's around, it's not a VPN. It's not a firewall. You can't just look at it in that instant. You have to look at it from identity, the endpoint, the actual data controls around that data, the apps, the infrastructure, the network, all of those things. And those are the challenges that I see companies having the most difficulty with when they're trying to build a strategy. Because if you just talk to a data center team and say, let's do zero trust, they're going to tell you build bigger virtual desktop environments. If you talk to a network team, they're going to tell you, let's do segmentation based on IP addresses and ports and use this legacy model. If you talk to security team, they tell you bigger firewalls, but you really have to look at what that entire ecosystem consists of and build the security policy enforcement model to align with what your future business strategy is, which is, we all know it, it, users are everywhere and apps are everywhere as well. And your, their right. data is. So that's really to get out of the different disciplines of IT and really move to that strategic model of including all of them in the plan. But when you look at all of those components, you could pull out 60% of your infrastructure run rate costs. Like Phil referenced before, when I was at my previous employer, we did the same thing right? Move to that model. Internet's the network in most of the locations. Cloud is a majority of the data center hosting environment. And that really took us to a point where we were able to pay for all of these security enhancements in a model that we were just able to recognize through savings and reducing other pieces and components of infrastructure. I've seen three things, three emerging themes in my sort of travels down the zero trust road. One is cost, and we've just talked about that. I think you can put a business case together quite nicely that shows that this is a positive return on your investment and a lowering of your operational costs quite quickly. The other one is just sheer resistance to change within your organization. And here's where you need your finger on your corporate culture and checking the pulse. But I think there's a couple of things that are helping remove this resistance to change. One is the user experience. They've all been shipped out and have worked from home for a year. And they're now starting to make comments like, you know, why can't I have the same user experience when I go into Office 365 in the cloud as I do as to a proprietary app in my data center? I click on Office 365 and it's right there. When I go to the one in the data center, I have to go through and establish a VPN session with multiple sign-ons, and then I have to sign on to the application. And sometimes it drops and there's latency and it's flaky. And I just want the same user experience. So you can use that, this new way of working and the sustainability of new ways of working to your advantage. Lots of HR programs are coming out in big organizations where they're spending money to make people feel comfortable of working from home, maybe full-time, maybe part-time. We've seen organizations reduce their corporate footprint 
So their real estate footprint. So there's savings coming out of a reduction in real estate that can be redirected into programs to make those savings and these new ways of working more sustainable. And then the third one is a bit of a surprising one, but I've seen this so many times, is the IT group itself, the technology change agents themselves. And what you've got to be careful of as a technology leader is who you listen to and bringing those groups together. Because if you listen to your networking team, your network engineers, they're all about CSPM, cloud security posture management, or in the old days, this would be around config management in the data center. They're really configuration driven, and that's how they want to continue to provide cybersecurity. But if you listen to the applications groups and maybe the majority of the cybersecurity groups, they're all about identity access management or CIEM, cloud infrastructure entitlement management. And their argument is, let's not let the bad guys get to the infrastructure. Let's decide who we let in first before they even get there. And I think the answer is, and they don't want to hear this, you need both. You actually need both, but you need both working in an integrated fashion. And that's why I really like um, Zscaler's approach to zero trust, because you can have both. It is integrated and it works well at scale. Dan, you have the last word. Thanks, Les, and, and thanks, Phil, for joining. And, and honestly, the um, Phil, you referenced kind of Zscaler's approach, right? I mean, so for me, people often ask, how do you get started, right? And for me, I, I have a couple tips that I talk about, things that we did. I mean, obviously, organizations are looking at MFA and have already implemented it, but making taking it one step further and kind of reducing that standing admin access and moving to just-in-time or just-enough access Again, all around least privileged access principles, but really that focus on decoupling application access from network access is a huge starting point. And when you talk about the simplicity and the configuration management and all of this, where you kind of make an assumption that everybody's on the internet, right? You build your security architecture in this future architecture with kind of like the lowest common denominator is just assume everybody is on the internet, assume that there's an angle for breach, and then you move forward with those policies that say, look, I'm Dan, I can only connect to these very small portions of systems within the environment. But that just allows you to deliver those applications with policies that are based on kind of user and app context as opposed to network, right? Which that's the thing that held everybody up in the past. And so I think when you get that mentality to start moving forward with that, that really helps drive that zero trust strategy conversation within your business. And then you can start aligning strategic business priorities to what you're able to deliver in that future architecture for security. Well, I want to thank Phil Armstrong, legendary technology leader, and Dan Shelton, head of transformation with Zscaler for being on the CIO Evolution, where we explore the Chief Information and Technology Officer's role in executing the digital transformation at a global organizational level. Gentlemen, we could do this for a couple of hours. I appreciate it. You were fantastic. And I know our audience will love this content. Thank you very much for talking about Zero Trust today in the evolution of the enterprise. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Les. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to the CIO Evolution. Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find more episodes along with other podcasts on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of the recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2021.